talk to him and in five minutes or two minutes you'll find out real quick that he he's all about serving God he has he has served as a, a preacher in the past served as an elder in the past and and even uh, set aside some things so that he could focus on his family and in an egotistical world Amen. there aren't a lot of folk who will set aside uh, uh, certain things to to take care of their first ministry which is the family amen, amen. Um, so I, I just applaud him. I'm thankful that he's here. Thankful that he's here to to share the word this morning. I'm I'm, I'm thank I get a little break. Amen. Amen. I get a little preaching too. Amen. So y'all don't mind if I bring up the preacher. Amen. Amen. If you would open your song books, y'all know what song I'm fitting to say. If you'd open your song books to him, 478 and 478. Oh, I want to see him. Amen. And 478. Oh, I want to see him. I'm going to just do a verse. Um, amen. Amen. He said, but Mervyn said two verses. So, uh, amen. I was always taught to respect your elders. Amen. And 478. Oh, I want to see him. Let us, let's, let's, let's go ahead and let's sing. As I journey through the land, see him. Ooh. 
Look into his face. Amen. Talk to it. Let him speak to you. Let him love you. You're going to see his face one day. His eyes and face see his face even now. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all. It's good to have our visitors with us. Amen. And we're delighted to have you. And I hope that your time here is profitable for you. Being built up in the Lord Jesus Christ and pray so that you can live for Him this week. Uh, this morning I'm greatly honored to be preaching. Amen. Brother Ken asked me several months ago if I would like to preach, and here I am. Amen. I thank you for entrusting this pulpit uh, to me. I admire Brother Ken and Sister Dominique and uh, little Nate there, mm -hmm. and for the love for their Lord Amen. and the love for this church. And I think that's evident to all of you that know them better than I do. And I think all of you will agree that one day I think uh, Nate's going to be a good preacher. <laughs> <laughs> just like his dad. Just like his dad. I have no doubt about that. Uh, this is the first time that I have uh, preached in at least three or four years. Um, I came to New Jersey back in 1991 to do just that, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good Amen. news of God and his love uh, for all of us. Lord. Amen. Some 27 years later, I stand here today a little older, a little tireder, <laughs> Uh, well, a little greater, <laughs> hopefully a little wiser, but a broken man. You see, over the past two to three years, I've lost my wife of 33 years, close to. Uh, we're separated for a, a second time, a lengthy separation. And I've lost two to three jobs in two to three years. Soon to be homeless. And I, I'd say I kind of lost my way. But I know the way. I know he's faithful. He's loved me through thick and thin. Yes, sir. He's loved me with an everlasting love. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he is faithful. And he's yes, going to guide sir. me through this. But I just felt like it was important for me to share uh, that uh, so that the focus is not on me, but that in light of what we're talking about this morning, I think you'll see a great uh, contrast between uh, a broken man, broken people, with the great physician who is able to heal yes, us. Amen. 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 It's that face we're going to see Amen. one day. Yes, sir. The title for my lesson today is Confessions of a Warrior. Amen. I wish I could say Confessions of a Warrior. But I don't want to be a warrior anymore. There were times I loved that song at the Tulsa Workshop shop back in the late 70s, Hard Fighting Soldier, Brother Willie Franklin. Doesn't pray, uh, play, I think he played, did uh, he played for somebody? I don't, know if he, I don't think he is Wilbert Montgomery, I guess, that played for the Eagles. But Willie played somewhere up there in the pros. But he, he sing that song. And uh, I've been trying to be a hard fighting sort of soldier. Uh, but sadly, uh, more times than not, I've been a, a whiny little warrior. My text is read in your presence is Matthew 6, 33 and 34, as Brother Ken read. And let me read that one more time, this time from the New International Version of the Bible. Bible. Read it along with me, please. And again, these are red letter words. So Jesus Christ himself uh, 
said these. He said, but seek first his kingdom. Seek first the Father's kingdom, my Father's kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Everything that he's talked about in verses 25 through 34 about eating, being clothed, and and shelter and things that we all need. Jesus knows that. Mm-hmm. He said, if you seek first the kingdom of God the Father and his righteousness, all of these things are going to be given to you as well. That's a promise I'm making. Yeah. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. This is a command, it's an imperative in the Bible. He says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Amen. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Amen. So if we look at 25 through 34, I'm not going to take the time to read these. I think most of us are pretty familiar with this particular passage. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The context is Matthew 5 through 7, three chapters in it. Uh, oftentimes been called the summer, uh, Sermon on the Mount. And in Luke chapter 6, there is kind of a similar parallel. Uh, and in this passage, Jesus is uh, giving a sermon, if you will, early along in his uh, earthly ministry. And he's dealing with uh, people. Uh, I like to refer to us as knuckleheads. He's dealing with a lot of knuckleheads in front of him here at this point in time. And he's dealing with uh, knucklehead problems, people problems, uh, religious people, people that knew his word, most of these are Jewish people. And so he's talking about things in the Sermon on the Mount, things like anger, lust, Revenge, boasting, pride, hypocrisy, judging others, worry. And we tend to downplay these problems. I think I do, uh, in my thoughts even, and in my words, and and when I'm talking with people in life. Uh, But Jesus didn't, and he still doesn't. He tells us the truth because he is the truth. He shows us the way because he is the way. And he gives us life. Life is really life. It's more than anything you're going to find out there, young people. This is life abundantly. He tells us the truth that these things that I just rattled off, anger, lust, worry, they're sin. And sin separates us from his Father and our Father God. And we know that. But we need to drive that home and just really camp out on that to realize just how much it hurt God and how much it hurts him. Because Jesus, the one we see face to face through the eyes of faith in one day, we will see him, and we'll have to give an account for how we think, Amen. what we say, Amen. how we act. Amen. Amen. He wants us to know that in this life, as we as we follow him, if we choose and strive to be his disciples, that we can trust him, Amen. that we can Amen. walk with him, Amen. that we can listen to him, Amen. and that everything else will take place. Amen. 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 I, I just whistle this, and you tell me the song that I'm whistling. Don't worry, don't worry be happy by who? Bobby McFerrin. Uh, Bobby McFerrin, don't worry, be happy. Now, I wanted to fit that in somehow in the sermon, so that's why I just tucked it in right there. But you know what? That's a 
if you hear that song and you check out the YouTubes and you look at that, you know, it's some deep subjects. And in this one YouTube, along with Bobby and another dude, there is a fellow named Robin Williams, a lighthearted uh, person that uh, ministered in, in a way, a comic relief to a lot of people in our country and throughout the world. And yet we all know where most of us do that he ended up killing himself. And so I think at the end of the day, when we're addressing this topic of worry, we don't want to downplay it. And I think there's some truth to Bobby's song, but uh, the antidote to worry is not to be happy. Now, happiness is a byproduct. Right? It's a byproduct. Does God want us to be happy, Brother Ron? I know he does. Because he came to give us life and life more abundance. So I know he wants us to be happy. But that's the caboose. There are a whole lot of feelings in that caboose. He wants to keep us happiness, happy in the caboose and in the train as we go through this life. And of all people, you've heard it said, my kids said it before, but of all people, we should be the happiest people on earth. And yet, you look at church folk, and sometimes you don't see that on our faces. I see it on a lot of your faces right now. The ladies smiling, beaming because of what you have inside you. And the face you're still looking at through the eyes of faith. And yet, you know, we're beat up by the world, right? You go in the world, you're beat up by the world. And, and you know, cliches, just say no, don't worry, be happy, all these things. You know, I'm going to cut it. Commands of God. But the power of the Holy Spirit to obey those commands is what we need. So when Jesus says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, I've got this. Right? Amen. And we believe it. We, we can believe that. Yes. Because each day has a lot of trouble. And, and some of us here have had a lot of days, you know, and some of you have had a lot of years. You've seen a lot of trouble. Amen. And just a quick, quick note of just what Sister Gigi said about one, one individual. Um, when I taught in Camden, uh, you know, a number of my students, several funerals I attended to, and there was a prevailing feel and feeling for some of the youth at risk youth in Camden City back uh, in 2003 and 2003 and following that, you know, uh, I'm just going to do what I do because I'm not going to make it to 30. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. some would say, I'm not going to make it to 25, and, and I can count five to 10 of my own students mm -hmm. that didn't make it to 25. Yeah. I can count a few few of my fingers of those that took the lives. Some of my students, one of them had a gun in his coat that winter, and uh, he, he went out. I don't know if this one killed, but that bullet killed one of them. Another student, a young man in Canada. But um, you know, these are real life things that we face. And you're you're well aware of what I'm saying. So when we talk about worry, you know, how will it help us to process through things like this, tragedies, and how will it help us better yet be a source of encouragement and strength? And part of the solution rather than part of the problem in our communities. The worry's there, the concern's there, you know, but let's not rationalize it and say, well, you know, this is this is really serious, right? It's really deep. The loss of our, our lives. Some of you remember in the 60s there was a commercial. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah. yeah. And it was a commercial for the NAACP. Yeah. A young African American boy or girl, and it's a terrible thing. Yeah. And God, who made us, our faces can be like His faces, Amen. showing that not a clown smile, but a real deal look of Amen. confidence Amen. and smile and assurance Amen. before those. And be part of the solution. Amen. The and that's what we all want to do, right? I know that. Yeah. To be a fact. A 
okay? But the, the situation here is, you know, we can't just rationalize it away. So I was just, you know, you know, I'm a worry ward, or I, you know, I've got a lot on my mind. You know. that, that, that's, you know, we, we grow out of that. You know, and we go into so much not of thinking about that, and how we think is so critical behind this whole situation, right? Yes, how we think as a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh in her heart, Amen. so is she. And you know that, you seniors know that, you see it played out in your life. And those in, in, in midlife, and those who are talking to youngins too. You know, as you think, that's going to determine Amen. who you are and who you become in life. Amen. It will happen. Amen. It will happen. So let's just be honest, and, and when we talk about lust and old flip, I liked it too in the 70s, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do anything. Right. Just like God, the Father, doesn't make us do anything. Come on. Okay, he doesn't. No. But I tell you what Satan will do with his dastardly deeds and all his, his hype and everything, and he'll make everything, all these things, anger and lust, or I have a right to be angry. I have a right to take vengeance and all these kind of things and all this stuff and the Lord Amen. speaking in a small, still Amen. small voice. Amen. And the Lord, is he going to shout that out? Amen. The opposite to that, Brother Mervyn? No. Amen. The Lord's just going to say, Come on. You've got to spend time with me alone, right? Amen. You know, it's in the morning and the night. I said, Well, it shouldn't be an either or. You know, you greet the day and you exit the day with him. He's just the only one. There might be somebody. And you're to your side, a spouse, but you're with the Lord one on one. And you're just saying, Oh Lord, Lord, help me to be better tomorrow than I was today. Yes. Help me to go forward yes. because we're not playing a game. We're not playing a game. And this, this is for keeps. And I think we all understand that. Amen. All right. So basically, what I want to look at, I want to look at worry, the problem, the teaching, and the challenge. So the problem, I think, you know, we've been developing that these last five to eight minutes. That there's a serious problem in our, in our world, and it's work. And it's so serious, and it's such a fatal disease, and it's such a problem here on earth that it really has infested the church. It is among us here, even in this building at 27th and Garfield. Mm -hmm. It's in the big church buildings in Camden. Uh, church of the Nazarene, Baptist Church, some of the churches in uh, Philadelphia, uh, St. Matthew's in Williamstown, and Calvary Chapel in the Northeast. Okay. Worry. Mm -hmm. It's such a subtle tool. It's one of the most effective tools of Satan. His word. It's his word. Now see, is this little guy up here worried? He's between his mama and he's between his dad. He knows his love. He doesn't doubt that at all. He's just having a fun time. I'm hoping for an idea. But he reserves those. He reserves those for one greater than I. And rightfully should. Okay? But, so what we're dealing with here is something that we really need to uh, look at as a problem. And I, I thought hopefully we've established that it is a problem. Let me just reiterate, maybe for another minute or two, though. When we worry, let's just think with me along these lines. When we worry, think about it. What do we do? What are we doing when we worry? You just replace a word. Think of a synonym in your mind right now, that word you replace it. And I thought of a few. I thought of doubt. Amen. When I'm worrying, I doubt. I'm doubting God's word. I'm doubting God's promises. Amen. I'm doubting God's faithfulness. Amen. I'm doubting Amen. God Himself. Amen. And it it really doesn't matter if if uh, what I say or or what I'm doing on a Sunday morning at eleven or whatever. If my mind is not taking captive every thought and bringing them into the obedience to Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Because when that takes place, then we can definitely get a framework from which to deal with work, lust, all of these different things, right? Okay, so 
So we don't want to be doubters. And I used to, when I preached John 20 back in the day in the 90s, and old DT, Downing Thomas, and Jesus said, because, you know, he wasn't there in the first occasion of the upper room, and uh, he didn't see Jesus. So when he, he was there, he said, oh, I, I, don't, I won't believe until I see the what? You know, the nail prints and the inside. And, and I kind of, but I'm going to put a title on this song, uh, or on this sermon, Old DT, Downing Thomas. Okay. But, you know, doubting is not anything to be toyed with. Doubts, I mean, it's one thing to be honest. And we have to be honest. And we do have doubts. And we will have doubts. Okay? But admit it. Don't deny it. Press on, though, and deal with them in the way that God wants us to, and that is to trust. And we're talking a lot about that in the clarification this morning from Leviticus 26 about what does biblical trust mean? And Brother Ken has been making some good, strong cases for it. It's an action verb, right? It's action. Amen. Doers of the word, not hearers only. Okay. Now, when we say we trust God, but we worry, you know, that, that's not right. Worrying is not having faith. It's doubt. We pray to stop Amen. worrying about something. We let go and let God deal with it. And yet, how many times, if you're like me, and you know where I'm going with this, probably you can guess that it's not very long. It's just a question not... Yeah, but when we take it back, yeah. mm -hmm. we take it back in the eye, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Now, isn't that dumb? Yeah, we yes, yes, How sir. dumb is that? Well. <laughs> we are the crown and glory of God's creation. Yes, and the God of heaven that tells us he still storm, waves, all that. And, and, you know, he's done all these things. He's shown us that he's faithful in our lives yes, to us. Who had our lives, and yet, how dumb is it that we that we even want it back? Mm -hmm. we just, I mean, that's sick. That's sick thinking. It's not thinking in the way that God, it says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. God wants his mind to be in your mind. He wants us to be thinking about the thoughts that Jesus would be thinking and looking at things from his perspective, not our own. They're so limited. And then another thing we do when we worry, we dethrone God from his rightful place Amen. in our hearts Amen. and in our minds, Amen. right? Amen. We take him off the throne and we put ourselves on the throne because we might profess that we're Christian. We might profess that we, we, we I think, to a level believe that. And yet, pragmatically, here we go again. We're just, we think we can do a better job of our life. But that's certainly not the case. And I think all of us need to just reflect very briefly to see examples that the Holy Spirit has putting through our minds right now. And remember, no, that's not the case. You can't control uh, everything. You can't take care of everything. You don't have this with all these little euphemisms and cliches and everything away and just say, just admit it. You are a mess, you are a broken man, you are a broken woman, and the only way you're going to get fixed is by trusting in me. Really believe that, and it is work. It is a hard work, it's a hard job to do. It's a daily thing throughout our lives. It's trusting. It comes natural to us to worry, but it's not how God designed this to be. So that's the problem. I'm too long-winded with that. Jesus is teaching. We've already... Uh, started with it, but let me just briefly say uh, that this passage is familiar to us. He designs us to enjoy and thrive in a growing relationship with God, to trust in God, to believe He loves us, to depend on Him to be faithful. And so the command is, after He's talked about the idea of don't worry about what you're going to eat, and don't worry about what you're going to drink, and all that. He's not at all talking about planning. God gave us a mind and, and a brain to see the Proverbs, the Old Testament, and other passages of the New Testament. This is clearly saying we took plan. And we talked about planning finances in the month of July. Critical. Essential. Okay? But no, you know what I'm talking about. The worry. The worrying type deal. And Jesus says, here's the command. Don't worry. Do not worry. The command is instead, 
replace that with seek ye first yes, the kingdom of God. Amen. And my promise to you is, my promise is, I'm going to take care of you. Yes, I've got you. Amen. Okay? And I will always have you. Oh, and that's the kind of thing I think, not only just for our youth that I'm looking at, handsome group in the back corner there, uh, wonderful young men and women in the making. Amen. But to all of us, to finish strong, and even to the youngest of the youth, we need to just understand that God is for us. He's yeah. not against us. Yes. He doesn't make any jump. Yes. And there are no lines that he won't switch. And we can't depend on government. We can't depend on politics. We can't depend on entertainers. We can't depend on all of these things to kind of help us in this situation. We're thankful when people stand up and share Christ entertainers. We're thankful for these signs being held in the in the football stadium. But we are not dependent on that. And it's too big and too much as his mistake. God wants us to seek him every day. And I think the dynamic will be is that when you realize just how much he loves you, how much he loves you, and he's for you, he's not against you, He's for you with an everlasting love. Amen. That'll be the emphasis. That'll be the motivation that will allow you to test him. Put him to the test. Trust him. God, I believe you today. Whatever I'm looking at, whatever you're looking at, I trust in you. You just do that throughout each day. You tie that together one day after a time. Amen. And it's, you'll be all right. Amen. And God will have had it in your life. And no matter what you're going through, then God's going to have a testimony in you Amen. to everybody around you that Amen. knows what you're doing. Okay, so basically uh, there are other passages I wanted to get to. Uh, you know, the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, God made us to live in daytime compartments one day at a time. Uh, it is so true, isn't it? You all know how true that is, really. All we can take, brother. Mervyn is one day at a time. Yes, the old song, this kind of old country gospel song, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. Amen. That's all. Okay, one day, you know, but sometimes it's one hour at a time, right? Yes, sometimes it's one minute yes, on the job, at school, this confrontation, this conflagration, all these things come in on the horizon, you see, just like, Everything you can do. Trust me. What is the work of God? The work of God is to truly believe. It's to truly trust. And everything's going to fall into place. It's easier said than done, admittedly. Another passage I want to look at uh, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. You don't need to turn there, but remember what Jesus said come on, come on. Be all ye are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest but to your souls. He doesn't want you to worry, He does not want you the word. He wants you to trust him and get under his yoke instead of just being on, you know, with a sense of the world, and the, not the sense of the world, fortunately, but the cares of the world on your own shoulders. He wants you to go underneath his yoke, is what he's saying. Yeah. And he wants you to see how light that will be if you're in it with him, if you allow him, if we allow him. Now, I do want us to go to Philippians 4 just briefly. And, uh, just want to look at Philippians 4 because not only does the Lord himself uh, teach us about not worrying, but he spoke through Brother Paul, and we've learned a lot on the last two Sunday mornings in Bible class about Brother Paul, and I learned some things I didn't know in uh, Ken's message concerning the Philippian jailer and the dynamics, the architecture of a jail, uh, Roman jail, and what all Paul and uh, Silas found themselves in and all of that. But Paul had learned through all that, I think uh, we already mentioned this earlier, uh, one bit again, that it, it's a lifetime, it's a working process, and, and to trust is not something overnight. And Paul learned this through the school of hard knocks, did he not? He learned it through one night at midnight in Philippi. I hope I never go through that. But what was he doing? What did we find out in Acts 16? Paul was doing in the midst of this muck, mire, and poop. You know, and with Silas, he had somebody. The Lord had not just an angel, but he had a brother in arms, a comrade in arms. Silas would have been stopped in a serious situation 
But what were they doing? Were they worried? The Bible doesn't say they're worried. Now, we need to be honest and real. I'm sure they had worries. Amen. I'm Amen. sure they had hurries and concerns, but the Bible doesn't say anything about that. And that's not what the jailer and all the other prisoners heard right. from their lips. They were praising God. Uh -huh. They were praising God because Paul had the wisdom and maturity to know, and Silas did too, his understudy, just what fruit is going to be, before, be born through this dilemma, through this sewer of a situation. God is going to in Philippians, he loved that church. He did. He loved that church. And he gave his blood, sweat, and tears, poured out in the Roman Empire, from the Roman Empire, the churches like Philippians. And so he learned the secret of being content. Let me just read uh, these passages from chapter 4, because I think here uh, is more on the teaching and more the motivation and more the secret that Paul had when he said that he had learned the secret to be content in every situation. In chapter 4, now listen carefully, church. Okay, chapter 4 of Philippians, starting in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, it starts in our mind. You have the choice to be happy. Happiness is a choice. You've heard that phrase. You have the decision every morning to choose joy or to choose misery, to choose Trust or to choose word. So choose, choose this or choose that. You have the choice. Amen. And God gave you that choice. That's a God-given right each of us has. And we want to use it in a wise way. Make the right decisions, don't we? Okay, so rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he had been in prison. Well, this was a little time later. And he was writing to Philippi to the church there also again from prison probably with a little bit more freedom. But he was able to write these words. So he knows. He's, not, he's practicing what he's preaching. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's practicing what he's preaching. He says, rejoice. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now listen to this. Verse 5. This is the key verse, guys. And gals. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because somebody read the next sentence. Oh. Oh, Lord, too. If you can just remember two things from our time together this morning, just to see in the Lord's face and realizing that He can show you that face through the eyes of faith every moment today. Amen. And this Amen. Week, then you'll be okay. Amen. Okay? Because He does make a promise to His brother Paul. Paul believed that. He's yes. serious. I'm talking about it. He believed the fact that the Lord was with him. And that's why he could sing praises in all this dilemma from a, a, a solitary confinement. Okay? He really truly believed that. He believed the Lord was with him. Yes, amen. Okay? So, let's read on just a little bit more. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Mm -hmm. Do not be anxious about anything. He's not playing here, Paul's not playing. This isn't just written so preachers can talk about stuff on some of mornings. He's saying this is the key to your life here. Don't be anxious about anything, church. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He goes on in verses 8 and following, talking about your thoughts. As a man, as a woman, think, so is she. Amen. And then he says in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. Yes, and I think all of us here know at times what it is to be in need. Yes. And Paul also said, I know what it is to have plenty. Yes, and fortunately, by God's grace, I think most, if not all of us here, have had times of plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether Amen. well fed or hungry, whether Amen. living in plain. I can do everything for him to sleep. So Paul says, You can do this. Amen. You can choose not to work. You can choose joy. You can choose to live a different way before people around you. And he learned it. And, and if Paul can learn that, we can learn that same lesson. It Amen. might have a different Amen. look to it, it might have. Uh, a different context, different place and time. But you can live an abundant, a triumphant life. 
You don't have to work. That's not your And then the third point, obviously, uh, we're going to quickly uh, delete most of this third point because I think there's challenge enough in just what's been said up to now. But our challenge today is to demonstrate a real and living faith uh, before all those around us. Yes, sir. And I think it's got to start really when we wake up and see ourselves in the mirror, right? Yes, so we've got to convince ourselves that we do believe that God loves us, that we are made in His image. He doesn't make any jump. And he wants to do a work in my life today. I don't care who you are. Nobody's exempt from what I just said this morning today. That can be a reality in your life this week, every day. So he wants us to take him at his word, believe his promise, and trust in his ability to lead and guide and empower us. Our challenge then is to place worry with faithful trust. Uh, I won't allude to it, but I will say, uh, if you can, uh, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with this book. It's a devotional guide you can pick up at a bookstore or Walmart or something. Jesus Calling by a lady named Sarah Young. But if you're familiar with it, I think you would respond that uh, it is a powerful book. This is my second copy. I'm just wearing it out. I'm just letting it uh, help me, encourage me through some time, tough times these last two to three years. So that Jesus Calling is an awesome book. And I was going to read a devotional about stop worrying long enough to hear my voice. I speak softly to you in the depth of your being. So every day, God is speaking to you. Amen. You know this church. You know that. I'm, I'm preaching to you. So to be doers of the word, the end of the Sermon on the Mount says basically, you know, uh, whoever hears these words of mine and does it will be blessed. So it's okay. A lot of the battle is to know what is right and what is wrong. What is God's will and what is not. And if it's talking about something like worry, to know what we're not to do. And that's true. But boy, we're blessed when we don't worry. Aren't we, aren't we, aren't we having a great day when you've gone a whole day without worry? Yes. Yes. For you, you know what? That's fine. Yes. And even now, you're harking back to that day. Oh, what Friday was that day for me. Well, just picture those and try to obey the Lord and, and realize that he's not just laying you down here as an orphan. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the grave is in you to help you, to give you power over the Word. Jesus calls us this morning to walk with him and to spend time with him to let him teach us throughout each day. He wants us to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. And I, I want on my tombstone, uh, if I had one first, it would be 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety. Why? Because he cares for you. Amen. When you really get that one little verse down, and another verse like, the Lord is at hand, then you'll be a gentle person. You'll be a kind person. You'll be a confident person. You'll be a powerful person. Not you, but him through you. Right? Say yes. amen, church. I don't believe that. He wants us to have a confidence in him and a knowledge that he, when he looks at you, he, he's not shedding a tear. Sometimes he is. But when he's looking at you, he doesn't have a frown on his face. That's happened at times. But when he looks at you, he has a smile. Not a clown smile. And for one of the first times in 39 years as a Christian, I sure enough said, well, Lord, I know if you're not laughing, something stupid I did. Just thirsty, I think. I said, Lord, if you're not laughing now, I, I know. But I knew he was laughing. I, I knew. I know in heaven, the God of heaven, had a smile on his face. If I had one of these lowly creation, put a smile on his face. Because he's just, he, if I have a sense of humor, he's my creator. Isn't that right? So he wants us to believe in him, to, to not worry, to trust in him. And so that's the invitation this morning, church, to respond to this message if you need to in a public way, if you want to come forward or stand up or just say, yeah, I do. Uh, Chad, you're not the only one to this problem. Worry has gotten the better of me sometimes. Or, or you're a Christian, 
And, and I think that's really your number one invitation. If you're not a Christian man, why don't you let Jesus uh, allow you the privilege of being underneath his yoke and, and just like that Philippian shape, being baptized in him. Because you confess it, you repent of your sins, and you want to change. You don't want to worry anymore. You don't want to do that anymore. So whatever the need, if you have a need right now, uh, respond in kind. Jesus' name, may you have a great week, a worry-free week. Doesn't mean stress-free, but a worry-free, joy-free. Amen. Amen. Stand up as we sing this song. Amen. 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 Amen.